Welcome to Passionate Voices. Our guest today is Mariam Namazi. Mariam is a secularist and a human rights activist. Uh, she's been involved in refugee issues for a long time, and she is also a speaker for many organizations that are involved in issues surrounding Islam and Islamism. In particular, she is a speaker for Fitna, uh, for Equal Rights Now, for the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain, for One Law for All. And she's a co-host of a YouTube channel um, called Bread and Roses, that is both in Persian and English, together with Farid Boris Puya. She's also involved with the uh, Workers' Communist Party in Iran. Uh, as a Central Committee member, I, I'm very pleased to have you on Passionate Voices today. Welcome, Mayam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Mariam, what's your passion? I guess my passion is uh, social justice in a sense. Uh, there's a really good saying by Mansur Hikmat, who's uh, an icon of the left in Iran. And he basically says people seek out the left because they want social justice. They want mm -hmm. to change the world for the better. And I think I would say that's my passion, just wanting to change things for the better and getting really frustrated at how unfair things are. So I'm lucky in the sense that I come from a background you know, of Iranian politics where there is the possibility to be part of a wider, widespread movement that is for social justice and that doesn't make excuses for either the Islamists or US-led militarism. Because sometimes I think people feel like they have to take one side or the other. And um, so in that sense, it's, it's helped me to be able to channel my passion into uh, real activism and one that I feel comfortable with and don't feel like I've made compromises principle-wise. And you grew up in Iran and then you moved to the UK with your parents um, when you were a teenager, right? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I'm, I was raised in Iran. I went first though to India with my, mm -hmm. my, my mom. She was going to put me in school there and then go back to Iran. But then my father and my three-year-old sister who was in Iran at the time he told my mom not to come back. And mm. so we were in India for two years and then we came to Britain for a year, but we weren't allowed to stay in either country. So then we went to the US and that's mm. where we managed to get residency. And I returned to Britain in 2000. So I see. And so when you uh, left Iran uh, as, a, as a young girl, uh, what was your perception of what was going on at the time and how did you process that? I mean, for me, I just, uh, I suppose the, the main issue for me for many years was refugee rights issues. Mm -hmm. It's still a very important part of who I am. I mean, in the sense of just seeing your, your entire life break away and mm -hmm. uh, having to leave, have to, having to leave lots of family and friends behind. And, or even if you have family who've also had to flee, they fled to mm -hmm. many different parts of the world. So you end up not maybe seeing your relatives for, for, for many years. Uh, so my grandmother, when she died, I never got to see her. My husband, his father just died quite recently. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to go back to the funeral. So it's that sort of, you know, break in everything that you know. Oftentimes when we hear about refugee issues, we hear about how people don't want newcomers to come to their countries, but there's less about how difficult it is to actually mm. leave everything you know behind and go to places where you may not feel welcome, you may not feel like you belong, and to try to rebuild your life. I mean, it was easier for me given that I was young, but much more difficult for my parents and for people who are older yeah, and, you know, who have to start all over again from the bottom mm -hmm. uh, after having done that, you know, years before. So I think for me that was when this became very obvious for me, this whole, you know, the, the change in, the immediate change in your life, I suppose. It started mm. with this whole refugee issue. And then trying to look at why people have to flee. And then it, there's this link with the Iranian regime and Islamic mm. regime. For me, I was raised a Muslim, but it was never an issue in my life. So I wasn't really forced to veil. I didn't go to segregated schools. I was treated very much as anyone else, you know, in my family. I, I wasn't treated differently because I was a girl. So mm. for me, the first time religion in all its glory became evident mm. was when it had political power. And that's why I think 
for me, it's very easy to make a distinction between people who are Muslims, who might even believe in Islam, though I'm an atheist, mm -hmm. who are just wonderful, regular people. Uh, and the fact that they all have differences of opinion, they're not just one mass of robots, you know, trying to take over the world versus the Islamist movement, which, which is trying to take over the world to mm -hmm. some extent. So if, if we're looking at the situation around the world right now, what we saw in the last one and a half years is the largest movement of refugees uh, in the world since the Second World War. And we've seen political responses to this all across the spectrum. And um, what I've observed, at least, is that um, I have found sanity neither on the political left uh, nor on the political right on a lot of these issues. On the political right, we see a lot of um, bigotry and we see a lot of hatred and a lot of let's close the border Orders. we cannot afford to let people in we cannot afford to help um, it is too much of a risk it's too much of a threat and there's broad generalizations as you say like everyone is against us everyone is trying to take over and then on the political left it seems to me that there's often a kind of naivete um, about Islam and Islamism and its intentions um, while at the same time a more positive and responsible attitude towards okay there are people who need our help um, and uh, there's stuff that we can do. There's the refugees welcome movement. There are people who actually genuinely are, are trying to make this crisis uh, something that we can overcome. Um, but when it comes to the issues of Islam and Islamism, many of those same people are uh, tending to turn a, a blind eye. And uh, I have found that there's only a narrow um, niche of people who are, are concerned about both of these issues and, and tackle them head on. And as, as one example of this conflict, I want to go to something that happened when you were giving a talk about uh, Islam and Islamism at Goldsmiths University in London in November uh, 2015. And uh, you were essentially giving a presentation and you were interrupted uh, and rudely multiple times by members of the audience. Um, and after that, uh, both the Feminist Society, uh, Student Society, and the LGBTQ Student Society at the university actually defended the people who heckled you. That is, at least is, is, as I recollect, uh, what happened. Is that what your understanding of the situation is that what happened? Yeah, can, can I go back to the refugee issue? Or yeah, absolutely. Talk, yeah, just, just to say a few words on that. You know, the, the problem with both the right and the left perspective on this, and I say this as someone on, on the left, is that um, they homogenize groups and mm -hmm. look at communities as being, you know, think that the, the, they all think the same way. So with the right, for example, they're concerned about refugees coming in because they immediately equate all of these people with ISIS, with uh, Islamism and terrorism. And the reality is that a vast majority of these people are not linked to that movement in any way. They're just fleeing for their lives. They're fleeing because they want to save their life. Why are they coming to Europe? Because, well, everybody wants to come to Europe because people want to live freer, better lives. And it's this dream of living a life without constraints. And I think those who've lived under the constraints of either a dictatorship like the Assad dictatorship or the Islamists understand this more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, this, this equation of Muslims, uh, first of all, all those refugees fleeing Syria are not Muslims to begin with. Even if there are Muslims, they're not necessarily Islamists. A very small minority are. With the left, too, what you see is that they look at refugees all as saints. So, you know, uh, again, this homogenization. And because they, too, see uh, Muslims and Islamists as quite similar with each other, they, they also conflate these issues. Mm -hmm. You find that they think that in order to defend refugees, they need to defend uh, the Islamists. Um, and again, I think what I, I'm trying to promote is looking at people as human beings. You know, mm -hmm. people are not more criminal because they are British citizens or American citizens, for example, even though U.S. militarism exists or imperialism exists. Do you know what I mean? There, mm -hmm. or, or you have the KKK or the English Defense League doesn't automatically mean everyone who's British or American. And it's the same with uh, with Muslims and Islamists as well. Islamists are a very small minority uh, to this majority. And I think it's important to look at people as individuals. Hmm. Of course, there will be those who will commit crimes and they might also have 
refugee status in the same way that people will commit crimes and they have US passports. You know, uh, look at people as individuals. If they've committed a crime, prosecute them. Mm. But that doesn't deny the fact that people have a right to protection, people have a right to refugee status, people have a right to live free from fear, from bombs, uh, from the Islamists, from, from, and so on and so forth. So it's differentiating between helping someone, for example, to be free from living a life of domestic violence, that's a right to be free from a life from violence. The person who faces domestic violence may also have, uh, you know, shoplifted. For example, mm. you can't then argue that we can't defend victims of domestic violence because you have evidence of a few people who've shoplifted. Right. Do you know what I mean? And so I think not placing collective blame is hugely important. And, and I think that's when we'll start having a more human uh, and principled uh, view on those who are fleeing. So there, there are some people who argue that we should uh, profile beliefs or profile um, like ideology um, to some extent. Um, like uh, I've seen surveys of refugees um, where you find, okay, there is a small percentage of people who enter other countries and they actually answer to the question of, uh, do you think there's anything good about uh, ISIS and what ISIS is trying to do? With yes, I think there's something good about ISIS and what ISIS is trying to do. And there are people who say that anyone who would say such a thing um, in a survey is probably not the kind of person who you should let into the country with open arms. What, what's your take on that? Like, do you support any kind of ide ideological profiling or questioning yeah. or integration efforts that try to counter this kind of extremism in a meaningful way? I mean, my point of view is, look, uh, you, cannot, you cannot base rights on people's beliefs. Mm. You can't say that you have the right to equality if you agree with women's equality. If you don't agree that women are equal, then, I'm sorry, this, these sort of laws of uh, universal laws of equality between mm. men and women will not apply to you. Uh, and and take any other thing. You cannot have fair wages if you don't agree in labor labor uh, trade union organizing mm -hmm. rights because it's the trade unions that fought for you. you. You're a strike breaker, or for example, you don't support your local union activism. Therefore, you can't have mm -hmm. the same rights that that have been fought for. You know, you can't give people rights that are theirs, that are inalienable. If we agree that rights mm -hmm. are inalienable, based on what they think and based on whether you like how they think or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a very fundamental thing. You know, if you need health care, you might, in, in America, you might be someone who doesn't support universal health care for everyone, but you still have the right to health care, whether you uh, think that it belongs to everyone or mm -hmm. not, you know. And I think that's one issue right there. The other is that um, just because people believe in a religion doesn't make them fundamentalists mm. in the, the Islamist sense, doesn't make them fascists, do you know what mm. I mean? So you can have people who are very conservative, who are anti-gay rights, who are anti-gay marriage. You have that in, in amongst Christians as well. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're you know, rampaging on the streets and attacking every gay person uh, that they come across or discriminating against them. You know, so I think there's a difference between conservative views and beliefs and action. Mm. Uh, you know, and I think we, if we look at Islamism in the way we look at the KKK, in the way we look at Christian white supremacist groups or mm. Hindu supremacist groups, it makes it easier to make a distinction between people who have religious beliefs who might be conservative versus the religious right wing, which is what we need to be concerned about because they're the ones who are terrorizing people. They're the ones who are imposing Sharia laws. The other thing too is that you can't make a distinction uh, on conservatism with one's immigration status because you mm -hmm. have people born and bred in the West who have pro-ISIS views mm. and refugees who have risked their lives defending secularism and what people would call Western values, but they're really universal values. And I, I think that's why if you profile people on belief, you're going to get it very wrong because it implies that people who are Muslim are Islamists. And that's a very wrong assumption because that's not the case. If it were the case, you wouldn't have mass migration from countries where Islamists rule, 
That's number one. If you look at the countries where people are fleeing, the top 10 refugee producing countries, they are countries where the Islamists are in power. A vast majority of them are. Mm. Second of all, if the Islamists were really what people agreed with, well, they wouldn't need, ISIS wouldn't need to put banners telling women how they need to dress. The Iranian regime would not impose segregation in football matches, for example. Why would they need to do that if everybody agreed with the Islamist version of, of the world? So obviously they don't, which is why prisons in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia are full with free thinkers, including Muslims, who mm. just don't want to live according to what you know the Islamists say is is the right way to live. You know, and so I think that's why profiling based on belief is wrong. I think behavioral profiling is what needs to be done. How do you uh, you know pro how do you find and seek out the Christian right who are bombing abortion clinics or trying to plan attacks? You don't profile every white male, mm. you know, because the white men in America, for example, are not uh, feeling discriminated against and targeted by the police. You don't do that, but somehow they do manage to know who these people are. In the same way, we need to behaviorally profile the Islamists rather than connecting them with Muslims. If we do that, and what, what we also do is we push more people towards the Islamist movement mm. because when you tell people that they're the only ones that represent you, whether it's via policies of cultural relativism and multiculturalism, mm. whether it's via profiling, you do end up pushing more and more people to that movement rather than rescuing them from that movement and making very clear that they're not one and the same. So at some point that though does translate into uh, governments doing things, right? At some point it translates into governments either deciding to let people in or keep them out, or it translates into uh, governments surveilling people or not surveilling them, um, trying to um, keep them from harm or, or keep them from doing harm. And like in, in your view, like what, what kinds of government interventions um, actually represent a reasonable defense against the Islamist threat um, and a, against Islamism as a political movement uh, that, as you say, wants to take over the world? Yeah, I mean, I think that governments obviously have an important role to play. Mm. You know, I, I may not like um, policies of governments I may not like many laws that are unjust, but nonetheless, when we're fighting for basic rights, we are de making demands upon the state, we are making demands upon the legal system. And a lot of laws uh, and policies that are progressive are things that were fought for by generations before mm. us, you know, and it's not something that's been handed over, it's been fought for. So I think within that same framework, it's important to pressure governments in order to do the right thing. They'll never do it on their own. And I think if we want to be safe, which is important, we all want to be safe. You know, for every Paris or uh, Brussels in the West, there are um, similar terrorist attacks and impositions of Sharia law on populations of the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, every there's a Paris or Brussels every day in, you know, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and what, what have you. So this security issue is not just an issue for Europeans or for Americans. It's an issue for, you know, Iranians and Afghans and Algerians and Moroccans. And so one is to, to recognize that this is a global phenomenon and we need to work together. We have allies across borders and boundaries and enemies that go across borders and boundaries. Mm -hmm. So you have people who are born and raised in Europe and the West who are killing women, and children and men in um, in um, ISIS held territories today. They are, you know, uh, some of them might even be white converts, you know. So I think to see this as a global thing is, is hugely important. Uh, and, and to put pressure on governments not to uh, deny civil rights, human rights, uh, under the guise of defending security. Because I think if we are concerned about defending humanity, an important part of that defense is defending rights, whether human rights, civil rights mm. that have been fought for and, and gained through a lot of hard work and sweat, tears and blood, really, you know, uh, I think that that's one thing. The other is rather than targeting citizens, uh, let's say, who are 
uh, Muslims, for example, uh, rather than doing that to compel governments to target the Islamists. Look, when mm. we look at, if we look at the bombings in Paris or Brussels, I think a vast majority of those who've committed these crimes in, in, in London, for example, in 7-7, they were already known to security agents. So it's, it's you know, it's why haven't they been under closer surveillance so that they couldn't carry out the attacks? Mm. Why weren't they stopped? And many are being stopped. I know that in, in Britain, for example, every week one or two terrorist plots are being stopped. Mm. So there is this acknowledgement even by security experts that we need to target the Islamists, for example. And there is, and many plots are being stopped. So there, some, at some level it is working. But to focus more on that than on pretending that you're, you know, on spending all this time and resources on targeting refugees, targeting Muslim communities, right. That's not going to work. The other thing is, look, if you look at Islamism as a political movement, there are aspects of that movement, important aspects of that movement, with very good relations with Western governments. Let's say the Saudi regime, the Iranian regime. These are pillars of Islamism, yet they've got very close relationships with Western governments. The Saudi regime gets lots of money in military funding, I mean, the police are even trained by the British mm. government, you know. So the, those are things, of course, that governments don't want to look at because there's profit involved. Nonetheless, if you want to have a comprehensive um, response to, to Islamism and not mm. just its terrorist wings, you need to look at these regimes. You also need to look at uh, the, the political aspects of this movement. Mm. You know, I think the problem is that a lot of Western governments feel that if they um, make concessions to the political arm of this movement, it will reduce terrorism, but it won't. These two are intrinsically linked with each other. Any strength that the military wing has, it will strengthen the political wing and vice versa. So when you look at the political aspect of this movement, the imposition of Sharia law, for example, in Britain, we have Sharia law courts, the British government refuses to address them. It says that it's people exercising their right to religion. Our position, the position of groups that I work with, along with other secular, even Muslim women's groups, is that the, this is a project of the Islamist movement, as mm. is gender segregation at universities, as is you know, the, the women's second um, class status um, in so-called Muslim communities. Also, the veil, the niqab, especially the burqa, these are flags of the Islamist movement. If we don't deal with this issue comprehensively, we fail to address it, and, and, and that's why we're not able to address it in the way that we must. So I, I think you brought up uh, something very central um, just a minute ago, which is the uh, the long history of support um, by the West for Islamist regimes. And I mean, that history is, is well documented and is also partially linked um, to just uh, the West looking for allies against communism and saying, OK, um, if we support the Saudis, the Saudis will be a power block here that will preserve capitalism that will preserve our interests. And what seems to have happened uh, in part is that those alliances have continued even though the strategic motivations that drove them in the first place have to some extent disappeared. And so now there's this chaotic situation where like the United States uh, and its foreign policy doesn't even know what to do with something like the YPG, uh, like the, the Kurdish uh, liberation movement. Oh, are they our allies? Who knows? Uh, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And they continue this, um, uh, this alliance with Saudi Arabia in, in the form of tens of billions of dollars, literally, of weapon sales uh, in the last few years. And, and one thing that I've wondered about as I saw the left and the right struggling with uh, issues around Islam and Islamism in the last few years is like, why is there not a broader consensus and a broader alliance um, among people of different political persuasions around this issue, for example, of Saudi Arabia, where it seems pretty clear that even if you're Sam Harris, if you're Richard Dawkins, if you're Mariam Namazi, like it doesn't really matter. Everyone should be able to agree that United States, the UK shouldn't be allied um, with a country that is the main sponsor of this very extreme ideology uh, that Saudi Arabia, Arabia has been promoting around the world um, for decades. and. 
Is it fair to say that perhaps activists in countries uh, like the United States, like Europe, should put more emphasis there and less emphasis on criticizing individual Muslims or criticizing even Islam as a religion? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things here that um, you raised. Um, one is the, the history of the West's support of Islamism. So even in Iran, for example, the 79 revolution was not an Islamic revolution. It was a left-leaning one. And the Western powers met at Guadeloupe, at the Guadeloupe conference, to decide that they preferred an Islamic state to a left-leaning one. And that's when we see the support for Khomeini, who was, you know, someone who no one knew really. Uh, and we know what's happened in, in Iran since then. So as you say, it was creating a green belt around the Soviet Union at the time. I don't think, though, that strategically it's no longer an issue for Western powers. I think um, whilst the Cold War has ended, it, I think religion in general is a very useful tool for governments to mm -hmm. control and manage uh, the population at large. So it, it, it's, it's continued to be a useful tool, even though including in societies where religion is no longer even relevant, really. You know, you still have such a strong role of reli that religion plays in Britain, for example, even though it's such a secularized society. In Ireland, for example, you see people voting. Uh, the first referendum in defense of gay marriage is in a country where uh, it, it seems so conservative and religious. That's the impression that's given because of the role that the Catholic Church still plays in that society and in the state. So, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's very useful. Also, if you look at um, Western government policies now with multiculturalism and cultural relativism, the Islamist movement is very useful in managing minorities on behalf of the state. So we're seeing a situation where the so-called Muslim community has, has their own schools, they've got their own um, uh, services even, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of faith-based services as if we don't all bleed the same, as if we don't all, you know, we, we don't need to go to a secular hospital anymore. We need faith-based services because somehow we're so different. Even our biology is different. We need separate services to, to address our needs. And also, of course, faith-based courts. And I think in, in the sort of climate where there are austerity measures, cuts in legal aid, for example, well, privatizing and outsourcing justice to Islamist groups has been very useful for Western government mm. policies. And so I think, in a sense, everything is so intertwined with each other. It's not just the Saudi regime. It's about so many fundamental policies, social policies, political policies in Europe as well, in managing um, uh, uh, so-called minority communities. But it's also very much part of Western government policy, foreign policy. So in, in Iraq, you know, dividing societies based on ethnicity and religion, the Iraqization of the world, really, it, it is a very good way of managing, um, or they think at least of managing. It's obviously been a disaster. Uh, in, in, in Europe, it's been a disaster across the world. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons why it's not so easy to separate all of these things. And again, with um, the Saudi regime, uh, you know, the, the problem I have with many people on the left is that they're happy to criticize the Saudi regime because it's got close relationships with the West, mm. but they're in bed with the Iranian regime. They're in bed with Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, and, you know, in, in that sense, if you don't deal with the movement comprehensively, you're not going to be able to address it because the Saudi regime is only one part of it. The other thing with the Saudi regime is that it's been untouchable for so long um, because it's so closed and we haven't been able to see the resistance and protest. They've been able to make it seem as if this is what Saudi society wants. Now though, that there are cracks and a lot of it has to do with, for example, the campaign for the release of Sa uh, Saudi uh, free thinker Raif Badawi, his wife's campaign and Safedar's campaign for his defense has cracked open that sort of uh, the, the, the facade of it being untouchable. And I think with that campaign, we are seeing the sort of momentous movement of 
groups and organizations who are coalescing together, as many of us have, in defense of Raif and against the Saudi regime. And I think that's something that we're going to see more and more of. Mm. And I, I take your criticism of the left um, as being often like supportive of Hamas and Hezbollah and, and groups like that as, as very valid. Uh, at the same time, one criticism of the left of people in the anti-Islamism movement and, and groups uh, that are against Sharia law and so on is often and this this it's being framed as we should not punch down, uh, we should always punch up. And um, the, the framing on the left is often to say, like, if, if you're criticizing Islam uh, as a religion, as, as a belief system of people, let's say, in, in the suburbs of France, um, then uh, we are effectively punching down. We're not punching up to people who have power, we're punching down to people who don't have power. And would it be fair to say that perhaps um, people who hold that belief and people who are concerned about Islamism can meet and, co and find common ground around this issue of political oh. connections, political connections to regimes, whether it's uh, Saudi Arabia or whether it's uh, Hezbollah, and jointly take collective action against uh, Islamism that is being promoted um, and focus more energy there, focus more attention there, and focus less attention on, say, Islam as a belief system and how ridiculous um, different kinds of religions may or may not be. I, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, those, those are very legitimate points. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that, uh, first for me, it raises the question, why do you think you're punching down? Do you know mm. what I mean? Uh, why? And I think it goes back to this fundamental belief that Muslims are the same as the Islamists. Therefore, mm. if you want to defend Muslims, you need to defend Ham Hamas and Hezbollah. So my, my point is that Hamas and Hezbollah are oppressive forces in their societies, uh, as is the Iranian regime, as is Assad's regime, which many on Stop the War Coalition, for example, will defend, uh, though they won't defend the Saudi regime. They're exactly the same as the Saudi government. They are power sources. Mm. They are a form of imperialism in the Middle East and North Africa. If you look at uh, many of our societies 30, 40 years ago, they have completely changed as a result of the Islamization of those societies. I'm not talking about Europe. You know, uh, music has been banned in Mali. The, the traditional dress of uh, uh, many um, African Muslim women has completely been changed. It's been de-Africanized and it has been Islamicized, you know. Uh, and there are many, many examples of this across the world. You just look at any society and you'll see it. If you look at pictures of women in Iran, in Afghanistan 40 years ago, they are unrecognizable today. You would not believe uh, that, uh, you know, they're the, the, the women from the same society. It looks like we've gone backwards rather than forwards, you know. So in that sense, why do you think it's punching down? That's mm -hmm. my first question. I think there's, there's a, a, you know, while this is often seen as a progressive position, there is a racism there. There's an underlying racism that one, those of us who come from minority backgrounds, that we can only ever be fascists, we can never ever be revolutionaries. And also that, you know, we're different from you. You know, you can take criticism of religion, you can take criticism of your far right movements. But, you know, if 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 we from within even even those of us who are within, uh, you know, and from those backgrounds do it, we're either, you know, we've taken on the colonialist mindset. We're promoting a westernized sort of neocolonial outlook. We're coconuts. We're native informants. You know, so it, it, there is this racism in that position that we cannot have free thinkers and revolutionaries. Only you can. Mm. Only, you know, only you have the toleration to laugh at your religion mm. and to poke fun of it and to uh, be anti clerical. We have to live within the confines of Islam and Islamist rules, and that's all that we deserve. You know, so that this cultural relativist attitude is so dehumanizing to begin mm. with, and it fails to see that, you know, just like you, we have dissenters amongst us, just like you, mm -hmm. we also want to live freely, live without constraints, particularly religion's constraints. The other issue is that, the other problem is that a lot of these groups see Hamas and Hezbollah or the Iranian regime as the resistance mm. because they have these blindfolds where the only concern they have is U.S. militarism and imperialism. And anything that seems to be opposed to this is their ally and their friend. And my point is, well, you can be anti-imperialism and you can also be anti-Islamism. Mm. And rather than siding with, you know, 
one of the bad, the two sides that are, in, in my opinion, two sides of the same coin, side with the working class, the progressive social movements, the political movements that are standing up to both. Why can't you do that? You know, mm. um, and and I think that's important. The other is, you know, people will often accuse people, even like myself, of uh, feeding into racism against Muslims because of my criticism of Islam and Islamism. And what I would say is, look, I don't blame you. You know, so many on the left, like the LG, the Goldsmiths. Uh, feminist society or the LGBTQ plus society which sided with the Islamists against me, I don't blame you for my death threats. Please don't blame me for racism because mm. I am an, a campaigner against racism and I fought for it tooth and nail as I have fought the Islamists. Blame the fascists and the racists for racism. Blame the Islamists as I blame the Islamists for the death threats. I don't blame everyone who appeases them. And that mm. is a long list of people on the left who should be siding with me. You know, so I think we put blame where it's due, hold those movements that are uh, carrying out racist attacks, that are promoting racism, uh, that are promoting terrorism, hold them to account and stand with those of us who are against both racism as well as uh, Islamism. So I, I want to draw the connection here with, with what I would describe as identity politics uh, and, and the left today. And uh, you, you said earlier, like one of the problems with this argument about um, punching down is that uh, they're not all the same. And uh, in fact, when you do that, when you homogenize uh, like that, uh, you essentially create these like isolated groups uh, where you say, okay, if there's abuse happening within this group, then we don't really care about it because that's just their culture or that's just their religion and we're not free to criticize it. We're not free to to uh, call it out. We're not free to name it uh, in, in the same way as we would in, in our societies, in our culture. And that, that seems to be, uh, the way I've observed it, seems to be uh, a, a, an outcome of this this um, view of identity politics, where you group people by their religious uh, identity or by other forms of identity. And um, so I, I want to draw the connection to uh, the Goldsmiths in incident. And uh, what happened there is that you were shut down, um, but or or rather, I would uh, I should say you, people attempted to shut you down. They disrupted and heckled you, and you carried on bravely <laughs> as they did so. And um, and they even tried to, to shut down the projector while you were speaking and, and pull the plug uh, while you were uh, showing a and slide. And this is a great Jesus and Milk cartoon. So I'll let, give you a chance to read which personifies this sort of accusations of racism. Jesus and milk. Calling it racism fails to understand that the other also has its dissenters who want to live free from religious strangleholds. Plus, isn't it racist to imply that all Muslims cannot tolerate criticism and free thought? Okay. Why do you turn it off? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Why do you do that? Why do you do it's that? All right. It's all right. Do not worry. It's all right. So I'll put it again. It's all right. It's all right. Just put it on again if you don't mind. Sorry, just one minute. We just have that. Don't be sorry. This is this is. I actually like you to see this because nothing I say can prove can prove what I'm talking about. You don't have to be sorry. You don't have to apologize for anyone. You don't have and to it, it was kind of baffling for a lot of people. I think um, progressives uh, on the left, people on the right, when these responses followed, where people at Goldsmiths University, students at the university <laughs> said, um, you know, we actually side with the Islamic society on this one, and uh, we hope that the university will not invite a speaker like that again, effectively. And <clears throat> what, what was your immediate response to that, um, your reaction to that, and how do you, like, uh, empathize uh, with that point of view? Like, what, what's your reading of the situation? How do keep, keep come to this conclusion that it's okay to heckle a speaker, it's okay to attack a speaker in, in this manner, and then side, in fact, with the hecklers? Like, what ideology drives that? Well, I mean, when, when that happened, I mean, you know, I, I don't expect much from the Islamists or the far right. I mean, mm. What they did didn't surprise me. I'm glad it was videotaped because I know what would have happened. I would have ended up being uh, vilified for it because mm. 
before the video went up, the Islamic Society did say that I basically violated their safe space and that I was screaming at them and that, mm -hmm. you know, they were, um, that, that it, you know, I discriminated against them and so on and so forth. So had it not been videotaped, I would have gotten the bad end of that deal because there's this assumption, that's the mainstream assumption, that they would be right and I would be wrong. And it's, it's interesting because all of this discussion is framed within the context of minority rights, but I'm a minority within a minority. I'm a woman versus uh, men uh, brothers, you know, the, the ISOC brothers who were who were doing this. And nonetheless, it was like, it, it's also, I'm an older woman, so I most probably am the age of their, their moms, most probably. So all of that, it, it seems none of that is relevant, which is interesting when you look at it. And the only thing that seems to matter is when you're looking at this power imbalance, which they, they talk about so much, is that they seem to be the representatives of power imbalance. And it goes back to this identity politics, doesn't it? Basically, what you're saying is that our fascists are the ones who need to be protected against those of us who are fighting fascism. Hmm. And, you know, so when they behave that way, I wasn't surprised because I've dealt with this movement for for many years now. I mean, I think it must be, I don't know, maybe 30 years, uh, mm. around 30 years, where in various ways I've been up against this movement. So for me, their behavior wasn't surprising. But when I heard about the solidarity message of the, uh, you know, ghost miss lesbian and uh, LGBT plus society and the feminist society, I, I did scream you know, at the top of my lungs, at my computer. And I just, because it does feel so hurtful. Do you know what I mean? I, mm. I can't explain it. I'm not surprised. And it's, I know it's business as usual, but it is still, it does feel very, very painful. Mm. And it's because, you know, they're the ones who I would expect should side with me. And that's why it makes it more painful. So it's kind of feeling like you're being stabbed in the back and in the front by people who should be standing side by side with you, you know, and so, Though I, I know it happens all the time, but I still find it really hard to get used to. Mm. Um, you know, so why does it happen? It, it happens again because I think uh, because of identity politics and the homogenization of the Muslim identity, those who are most fundamentalist, most conservative, most, uh, um, you know, um, uh, medieval are the authentic Muslims. And therefore, if you are a burqa clad woman uh, defending, you know, waving the ISIS flag, that is the authentic Muslim mm -hmm. woman. And if I or other Muslim are standing next to her having a discussion, these feminists will side with her, you know, mm -hmm. and it's and it's sort of like the authentic Muslim is always a, a reactionary. And I, I do say this, um, so, Part, partly tongue-in-cheek, but partly, you know, I mean it when I say that I feel offended on behalf of Muslims, you know, that mm. there's, you, you know, there's such a poor view of Muslims. Imagine if everyone thought every American was, uh, you know, like Donald Trump or, um, you know, Dick Cheney, for example, that, that, or I don't know, the KKK represented all Americans and that mm. in order to defend Americans, we must defend the KKK, you know, because it's your culture to be racist. And, you know, that's, you can't handle anymore. Segregation is part of your history. And why would anyone defend, you know, black and white people fighting for desegregation and join the civil rights movement that, you know, it, it's a violation of your cultural rights. Mm. You know, it's that sort of thing, and that's what's being done, not just in minority communities here in the West, but across the globe. You know, we, we have people being slaughtered, um, an entire generation, for example, slaughtered in Iran uh, by the Islamic regime of Iran, and you have Stop the War Coalition um, organizers kicking out political activists from Iran who have signs condemning the Iranian regime for its executions. Mm. I mean, sometimes it's just so bizarre. And I think what happened to real human solidarity that went beyond the sort of narrow identity politics, one which went beyond borders, beyond color, beyond sex, beyond nationality, to, you know, linking up with progressive social and political movements when when you can only 
see identities and the authentic identity is usually the one with power. Look, let's be clear, because who, who decides what the authentic identity is? It's those in power. It's the mullahs. It's the uh, Islamic organizations. It's Islamic states. You know, and so basically this left, which is, you know, uh, gives the impression that it's for the poor and the, you know, uh, the oppressed, and it's trying to help those who are being punched down. In fact, what it's doing is allying with those in power, which is so ironic when you think about it and so heartbreaking as well. And one of the other policies that get invoked in those contexts are these safe space policies. And I think it was also mentioned in, in this case, um, this notion that um, universities want to provide environments that are free of discrimination, free of harassment. Uh, and and uh, at, at the heart seems to be this, this idea that um, we want to protect people from re very real discrimination, very real hatred that uh, people have encountered um, on campus, uh, students have encountered in schools, um, bullying and, and so on. And, and so there seems to be like a, a well-intentioned sort of desire to protect people from harm at the root of the safe space policies. Do you, do you think that, that there is a good idea at the heart of them that's, that's worth protecting and, and changing? Or do you think it's just a, a completely um, wrong-headed idea to begin with? Look, safe spaces are very important spaces. You know, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that as someone who's ex-Muslim, I organize safe spaces for ex-Muslims to be able to take off their veil because some of them are still pretending to be veiled, who's still going to the mosque. So where they can come and talk with each other about issues that they face, ostracization, whether it's intimidation, or just how to break the news to their family without losing their loved ones, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think safe spaces are important. We all have our own version of safe spaces, don't we? Where we go to feel completely uh, comfortable and not under attack. And I completely understand particularly uh, those who face discrimination and racism in the wider society. And that includes people like me. Do you think racists can tell the difference between Muslim, ex-Muslim, migrant, citizen? If you're brown, you're brown. If you come from, if you have a different accent, if you've got black hair, uh, you know, it, it's obvious. I see it in uh, how sometimes my child is treated. who was born and raised in this country. He's 10 now. And, you know, he'll ask me, why are they looking at me this way? or why did they say that? And it's really hard to explain while, while giving him, uh, wanting to give him this feeling that he is a citizen uh, that belongs, you know. So these are things that we all grapple with, the sort of discrimination and racism. But the, the fact of the matter is that if you, um, if you are going to protect minorities at the expense of other rights, it's it's going down the wrong route because first of all, minorities need free expression more than anybody else. People who face discrimination, people who faced racism because free expression allows you to speak up and to criticize and to challenge. Actually free expression is the right for people who are powerless vis-a-vis -vis those in power. And therefore minorities are, are some of the most vulnerable with least power and influence in society. So they need that free expression the most. And when you start limiting it, even for those who you think, you know, are, are disgusting and vile, you, you basically, you, you create the framework where limits are possible. Mm. And it's those who have least power that face it the most. Um, and also the thing is that, look, creating a safe space for yourself is very different from then saying that society at large or universities at large are meant to be safe spaces because it's impossible right. in the sense that universities are places where you're actually going to hear things that might be very unsafe idea wise, you know, which challenges <laughs> your very being to the core and might even persuade you to think differently. And so I think, um, you know, we, we need to make a distinction between those. And also, I think one of the problems with this sort of defense of minorities by ensuring that they don't hear any criticism of their views has reached a point where criticism of an idea like Islam is seen to be the same as 
discrimination against and attacking and even violence against, you know, inciting violence against mm. uh, a minority community. And this is absurd. You know, this sort of equation with of speech with real physical harm is absurd. And I think to challenge that, we need to we need to uh, speak as loudly and as forcefully as possible and in order to start challenging these sort of limits to break the taboos that come with it and i think in a sense this is the greatest service you can do for minorities if you're so concerned about them well what's interesting also to me is that um, your talk for example was obviously a completely optional event right nobody was forced to show up nobody was like told you all must now be subjected to yes. <laughs> this presentation on, on islam and islamism yeah. um, it's, it's a very different situation from like a student walking on campus and hearing or let's say a racially charged slur being thrown at them right it's you're presenting um, to a willing audience uh, who all uh, essentially chose to be there and said, this is something that interests me. And yet members of that same audience then said, no, actually, we would like to stop you from speaking. Yeah. So it, the safe space doesn't really seem to apply in that same way to that type of setting. Like, it's a very different kind of setting um, than saying, we want our campus to be discrimination free, for example. But, but also, I mean, just to go over that, that event, what happened was, uh, not only did they, well, they had initially asked the Atheist Society to cancel my talk altogether, and when mm. it went ahead as planned, they basically came to cancel the talk. So, in fact, if any any violation of safe space has taken place, it's by the Islamic Society uh, brothers, uh, not mm. the sisters, because they were there. We had a conversation. We didn't agree, but it it was fine, you know. And uh, it, it included actually threatening. They they issued. Um, death threats against um, one of the audience members. So mm. by putting a gun to the head, uh, and you can't see the president of the ISOC doing that, but you see the person who he did it to telling the security guard. And you also see um, a Libyan um, women's rights campaigner, Magdalene Abeda, who is there. She puts her hand down in her face and she starts crying because it upset her so much. Now she's someone who was abducted by the Islamists in Libya for three mm. days and threatened with death. So when she saw the guy do this, it, she just broke down at the meeting. He also, another thing that's on the video is when he was finally taken out by the security guard, he went to one of my colleagues and went boom. And none of that seems to be all of that seems to be okay. And again, what's interesting is this idea that they can actually threaten people but because they're authentic Muslims, which is really saying that Muslims are violent, they are incapable of hearing anything that they disagree with, which again, let me reiterate, is so fundamentally racist. You know, that's okay. And um, it's, it's my being there that's a problem. And what I found really outrageous after this whole incident was the student union contacted me six via six emails left countless phone messages not to apologize for what happened not to say well we're sorry as the external speaker that you had to face this but please remove that video because it is violating the privacy of our students and um you know they they also made countless complaints to YouTube and YouTube basically said that because no one's named there's no personal details of anyone in the audience that they're not going to uh, force us to remove it and also you know uh, what I told the university was there's an investigation supposedly taking place don't you think it's good to have the evidence available Mm. but you, you want to take it down and I just met a student from Goldsmiths actually the same woman who filmed this she's a student there she's um a Nigerian women's rights campaigner and an artist. And she wrote a blog recently, her name is Sarah Peace. She wrote a blog about a, um, a class that she was in where the professor said that you cannot criticize FGM. FGM is female genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. Where um, and I only say this because some people ask me what's FGM and I thought oh my gosh this is bad if they don't know what FGM is so I said note to myself that I should read it spell it out but um, the the professor had said that you can't criticize FGM because it would then be promoting a white colonialist perspective and it would be denigrating um, minority populations 
Now, Sarah, who's a Nigerian herself and was outraged at this, saying that, you know, FGM is something that many African women are fighting against. Mm. Uh, many women across the globe are fighting against. How can it be Western imperialism and colonialism to do that? Now, she wrote a blog post about this. She didn't name the professor, but she wrote about it. Now, I, I met her just a few days ago, and she told me that Goldsmiths is thinking of putting her up for disciplinary charges because of her blog post. Mm -hmm. Now, none of the ISOC members of Goldsmiths who came and threatened uh, audience members, who came and disrupted the thing, none of them um, were put under disciplinary charges. And uh, Goldsmiths never said that they embarrassed the university, but they've told her that because she has embarrassed the university, that they are looking into it. And again, you know, it's this, uh, the authentic Islamist, which is our fascist, can do whatever the hell they want. They can come on campus day in and day out, um, impose gender segregation as they did at LSC, for example, at a at a dinner. And you have the head of the national union, the head of the student union, who's a white woman feminist, going and saying how wonderful it was. Well, gender segregation is like racial segregation, but she has no problem as long as the ISOC is doing it. And, uh, you know, on and on and on. And then you have someone like me and suddenly I'm controversial, I'm inflammatory, I'm inciting violence and discrimination. And then you can mm. see how alone sometimes uh, we dissenters feel, you know, especially when it's people who should be on our side doing it. And did they ever reach out to you, the feminist society, or did you talk to them after this happened, or the LGBT society? No, they, they never did talk to me. I know that there was some differences within the group. So I did hear that there were some who were not happy at the position that they took. But mm. they've never retracted their statements, even though Mohammed Patel, who was the president of the ISOG, uh, as a result of scrutiny on him, uh, you know, a lot of homophobic tweets came up and he was forced to resign. Forced to resign, they're going to bring another homophobic, uh, apostate phobic, human phobic uh, president and they'll carry on with their business as usual. But what's interesting is that because of his homophobic tweets, he was forced to resign. But he can issue threats against apostates, but you know, that's part of his culture, isn't it? We should just take it and respect it. And of course, it's our fault that we get death threats. You know, that's the other thing, blaming the victim. Um, there's a constant uh, blaming of victims, including by many on the on the left. Mm. Before we wrap up, I, I want to change uh, a little bit um, to a different subject, which is how you, um, as, a, as an activist uh, on these controversial issues, get attention and get visibility and get people to talk about uh, things that matter. And one of the things you have done often is to provoke and uh, to provoke within some of your presentations uh, to show things uh, that you think are relevant for people to see and for people to engage with. But you've also provoked uh, in protests and in other ways. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about provocation. I want to talk a little bit about uh, nudity as a form of prote protest and uh, how you've used nudity uh, as a form of protest. And um, what what is the value of transgression? What is the value of provocation and bringing attention to these issues in your mind? Mm. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, people will say that uh, I am unnecessarily provocative. And I think mm. it's not unnecessary. If you look at this movement that, I'm um, uh, opposing, it decapitates people. I mean, it flogs people for um, writing a blog. It actually still digs ditches and stones people to death in the 21st century, you know. So if you think that my coming out and creating a movement saying we're ex-Muslims and apostates, we have a right to live, uh, irrespective of what the Islamists say, and we're going to do it in public until blasphemy laws are abolished. If you think my, you know, saying that because my body is so despised and Islamists are so busy trying to erase and disappear women from the public space by veiling them, uh, by silencing them, if you think new protest is an unnecessary provocation, you don't get what we're up against. Mm -hmm. And you're too busy criticizing those of us who are trying to resist rather than criticizing the real fascists, those who are denying rights across the board, you know. So I think, uh, again, this whole idea of provocation goes back 
for someone myself as myself being seen as provoked goes back to buying into the Islamist narrative, accepting the Islamist narrative as the norm. So, you know, if anyone doesn't do as they say, because that's what you're telling me, do as they say, dress modestly and no one will bother you. Stop saying you're an apostate and no one will bother you. Look, we know that they are provoked by anything. Forget about protests. They don't like it if you fall in love with the wrong person. They don't like it if you're improperly veiled. You're still veiled because it's compulsory in Iran, but they don't like that it's not exactly the way they tell you to veil. They don't like it if you wear bright colors. They don't like it if you sing. They don't like it if you're gay. They don't like it if you breathe, <laughs> you know, if you dance. Mm. So in that sense, everything, every 21st century living act uh, of humanity is an offense to them, is a provocation to them. You don't need to draw a cartoon of Muhammad to provoke them. You can just be sitting at a, dis, you know, at a cafe in Brussels and you get it. You could be in the wrong mosque in uh, in Iraq and you'll get it. You could be at the marketplace at the wrong time and that's it. That's the end of your life, you know. So I think I want people to stop focusing so much on, on what we do and focus on them. And also, I, I will do anything and everything I can, you know, that is nonviolent and that is... Um, uh, uh, that that can challenge their their narrative, their status quo, and challenge them. I, I have a responsibility to do it for the people who I've left behind, for the people who live in much more restrictive societies than than I do, and who can't necessarily do what what I do. But of course, there was a woman in Iran who did a, a topless protest recently, and she said, "I'd rather be a rebel than a slave." In Iran, with a uh, Iranian landmark behind her. So this is something that goes beyond borders and boundaries. There's lots of people in Iran who support nude protest. There's lots of white feminists who oppose it. Do you know what I mean? It goes beyond race. It goes beyond nationality. It's about politics, radical, progressive politics that aims to change the status quo and the Islamist narrative. Unfortunately, so much on the left have become so regressive that they can't see progressive politics, even if it bites them on the ass. And they think, you know, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it goes back to this whole idea of free expression being a cornerstone of all things. So I, I have only limited ways in which I can speak. I can speak, I can use my body as a form of protest, I can organize uh, various movements, try to get allies across, um, uh, you know, various uh, borders and boundaries, whatever way I can, I can write, I can have a TV program that's incidentally broadcast in Iran via satellite dishes. So I, th these are the things I can do. Don't tell me how I should do it. Don't put limits on my activism. That's what free expression means. You do it your way and I'll do it mine. And I will do it my way. And as far as I can, I will push as much as I possibly can until the day that I die, because mm. um, I have a responsibility to do that. What is the the proudest achievement in that uh, form of activism for yourself? What is the thing that you look back to and you say, this really worked well, or this, this really brought a message across in a way that it couldn't have been brought across otherwise? I think, uh, for, well, for me, I have uh, lots of high points in the sense mm. of, uh, successful campaigns, whether it's preventing the deportation of um, a group of Iranians, for example, from the Netherlands, um, having people call me from the Iranian-Turkish border saying that they've been saved as a result of the work that I've done with others, of course, in the Federation of Iranian Refugees. Um, I have lots of successes of that nature, and it's just, um, uh, even if it's just one person, you know, the it's, it's just, it is that one person mm. that that has a different life as a result of work that's been done on their behalf. And um, there's also cases, human rights cases, for example, stopping the stoning of Sakina Mohammad Yashiani. I mean, that is such a highlight for me. The fact that her brother contacted one of my colleagues, Mina Hadi, her, her son, I'm sorry, who said, my mom's going to be stoned any day now. 
and we had this wonderful international campaign where we had actions in a hundred cities across the world and uh, you know she is now today a free woman so mm -hmm. um, and there are many instances of that sort and of course the council of ex-muslims i i remember when um it was started we couldn't find 25 names and faces of people who were willing to say we've left islam and a lot of them, if you look at the initial photos, are Iranian political opposition, which is used to criticizing Islam and the Iranian regime. And today, this it's become a mass movement, really, where there are ex-Muslim groups in many cities across the world, thanks also to, of course, social media and also the work of people like Richard Dawkins and, and their support of this movement. Um, and, you know... The fact that now wherever I go, there are people saying I'm ex-Muslim and it, it's it's because of the Council of Ex-Muslims that I was able to do that. And there's this great thing that we started, which was um, one of my colleagues started, Rehan Sultan. She's a Bangladeshi atheist. Mm -hmm. And she came up with this idea of ex-Muslim because. <clears throat> and it's a hashtag where, you know, someone will say ex-Muslim because I'm a woman, ex-Muslim because of bacon, you know. Uh, Rehan is was ex-Muslim because there's no 72 virgins for me. Um, so it was both funny but heartwarming as well. I just met a few days ago the woman who said hers was the one where her face was hidden and she said ex-Muslim because my father was an imam and he forced to be married me as a child, you know. So also very heartbreaking ones and people who said it was the first time that they ever came out as an ex-Muslim. There were more than 120,000 tweets from 65 different countries. So again, that's something where you feel, you know, you, you are having an impact. It makes a difference and, and that just makes you want to do more. The, the thing I guess that personally was the most difficult thing for me was, of course, nude protests because uh, I, I, I find uh, the fact that, you know, you are coming from societies where women are told to cover up, where your body is seen to be the source of chaos and fitna. There is this hatred of your own body in a sense and um, this feeling of shame. And to be honest, I can't say I've completely gotten over it, even though I've, I, I, I'm known now as somewhat a topless activist or a nude activist. The first thing I did was this calendar for Alia Magdal Mahdi. She's a Egyptian blogger. And she posted a photo of herself. And she said, put on trial the artists, models who pose nude for art schools until the early 70s hide the art books and destroy the new statues of antiquity then undress and stand before a mirror and burn your bodies that you despise to forever rid yourselves of your sexual hang-ups before you direct your humiliation and chauvinism and dare to deny me my freedom of expression she did this in egypt she was also kidnapped by the islamists she now lives in um sweden as an asylum seeker as a refugee so i did a um, uh, a calendar which is still available on uh, the website but i just want to show you um i did my photo and uh, mine was saying my body is not obscene veiling it is and it was the most difficult thing i ever did and uh it it was it took a while for me to manage to get my photo because it was so difficult and after that i did other actions in public um one was taking the Allah out of the Iranian regime's flag and putting something much more worthy in its place, which I, I wrapped it around my waist. And that was in front of the Louvre in Paris with Ali Amagda El Mahdi mm. uh, and also Amina Sabouyi, who's a Tunisian uh, topless activist. So um, I guess personally, that was the most difficult for me. Uh, and I, I always still say, put me in a room with you know, 20 Islamists, I'll be fine. But ask me to do new protests and it's so much more difficult because there's so many other things involved. And it's not seen to be as heroic. Do you know what I mean? There's this shame uh, attached to it. And there are people who still won't work with me because of, you know, that this is just going too far. You just go too far. And I think, you know, history is made by people who go too far uh, and who um, do things that are vilified, that are looked down upon, that are seen to be, uh, you know, rocking the boat too much. And so I think, um, no, I'm not going too far. The Islamists go too far. And we're just trying to um, defend humanity uh, against them, basically. Well, thank you, Mariam, for rocking the boat and for sharing your passion with us today. 
And um, f I would encourage folks also to check out Mariam's YouTube channel. Uh, you'll find a link in the show notes, um, which you can follow regularly uh, for information about uh, the work Mariam is doing on many of these issues. And also to uh, follow Mariam on social media and to follow her activism and to get involved uh, if uh, this show spoke to you. Uh, uh, look at the hashtags that were mentioned, look at the links. Uh, there's lots more here to read about. Uh, thank you again, Mariam, for being with us today. Thank you for giving me the time to uh, explain my uh, thoughts and views. It's brilliant. Thanks. Good thank luck you. with the rest of your program as well. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.